So we have one of the super coolest people coming in here. We have a panel, which we're all very excited about, the ultimate tech talk. And we will start with the first elect female, Premier Christy Clark, and two tech leaders, Daniel Dubois of Sherfield, Shershad and Andrew Palmer of Awake Lab. So come on up, everybody. <laughs> Happened. I know. What a good looking crowd, eh? <laughs> so, we've had a great morning. The energy's been incredible. Everyone here is excited to talk to you guys. Obviously, let's start with the premiere. What is so exciting? You made this event happen. What is so exciting about being here in front of these kids and getting a chance to talk today? Um, this, this is the most important thing. There are 5,000 people at this tech conference from all over the world, and we have 100,000 people working in tech now in BC. The thing that is most important about this is the fact that you are getting excited about the opportunity that's ahead. Because technology is all about getting to be your own boss at a job where you get to change the world, and it's when you're young that you are thinking about mo that most passionately and when you're full of all those ideas. So to me, Karina, the most important thing about this is seeing all the young people who are here who are thinking about, determined to be, excited for becoming tech leaders, creating ideas we haven't even thought of yet, because I believe in this room we probably have someone who holds the key to curing cancer or stopping the, stopping the, uh, the movement of climate change. Somebody who's going to inter, in, in, invent something that's going to protect our privacy in a world where we see technology outpacing our ability to be able to control it. That person may be in this room today, and I believe that all of those things are possible and that those advances can happen right here in British Columbia. Love it. Round of applause for that answer. <laughs> We were talking earlier about daring to dream big, like crazy big, and you have the premier saying, listen, the future is right here in your hands. And we have two phenomenal leaders. We'll start, start with you, Daniel. Yep. So one thing about Daniel, side note, he just came from China and he did a race, 100 kilometers on the Great Wall. What, <laughs> what, what, what did you take away from that? Yeah, amazing. So that's funny because it's never come up before, but uh, I was in uh, China, Shanghai, and Beijing for the G20 Young Entrepreneur Alliance Summit, and I was meeting with the CEO of a company called Sanfo. It's like the Mount, does everyone know Mountain Equipment Co-op here? Let's see a show of hands. Make sure you guys are listening, amazing. So this is uh, the China version of Mountain Equipment Co-op. And in China, it's all around building relationships. So I asked him what I should do for the weekend that I had off. I had a flight on Sunday. And uh, he said he had tickets to a race he could get me in. Sure enough, it's a 100-kilometer race along the Great Wall of China. <laughs> and I wasn't even in shape to do a five-kilometer run, right? And it's bumpy. And then, <laughs> <laughs> the Great Wall of China is not a flat surface. Stairs like this. So anyways, it was actually only the first 6K that was along the Great Wall of China. The rest were up and down mountains, spiders like that big. And I'm a tall guy, so I was taking out all of them. But anyways, back to your point, what I learned is uh, there's a quote in sports. I played competitive rugby and basketball, um, not to the standard of um, this amazing <laughs> athlete over here. But there's a quote that says that it's 30% physical, 70% mental. And I remember I hit a wall at the 28-kilometer mark, and I was done. I was trying to figure out how I would pull out of this, this race or as a heat wave. And I remember thinking if it was 30 kilometers, maybe I could finish yeah. it, but it was 28 and I just felt like I had nothing left. And uh, meanwhile, um, I finished the 100K. Well, my, my ankles were like that big. <laughs> I was almost <laughs> crawling over the finish line. But it just, it just taught me just how mental everything is in our lives, right? And that's just one, one example. Sport is just a reflection of how we live our everyday lives. Mm -hmm. What a great story, because we've talked about this this morning, how everything's not going to go according to plan. There's going to be difficult times. But is it, here's an example of somebody who found a way, and it is mental, but you got to get through it. And talking about getting through it, 
Andrea, you've been, you've taken your passion and your purpose, but you do things extracurricular, extracurricular that about, like you do martial arts and stuff. How do you describe being a woman in the sector? Um, I think for women in tech and for women in, in anything that's kind of un underrepresented or any kind of minorities, you really have to know that you're there for a reason and that you bring something unique to the table. And so even if you feel like you shouldn't be there, you're not qualified enough, um, you know, you have to find out the way that you as a unique individual can add value to that situation and own that. And know that you don't have to know everything. You can ask for help and you should ask for help and you should find people who know things that you don't to support you to get better. But that's really, that's really the thing. You have to believe that you're there for a reason and you have to ask for help when you need it. Because you decide who you are. Exactly. Other people don't get to decide who you are unless you let them decide who you are. You decide who you are and don't be afraid of deciding. Don't be afraid of taking the risks that it's gonna to take to do what you wanna do and to be who you are. Whether you're a guy or a woman or whether you're from a visible minority, and you know, I mean, I mean, Karina, you would speak to this, right? As a, as a world level soccer player, an athlete, an immigrant coming from a small community like Maple Ridge, there were all kinds of reasons you couldn't do that. Everybody would come up with reasons you couldn't do that but you weren't scared or you found a way not to be scared. Yeah, you just figure out your passion and you follow it and you, your vision clear. We talked about this before of like, it doesn't matter what other people say about you. It's what you believe about yourself. We have living proof up here. You guys are living proof. It's not what everybody else says that you should do. It's what you believe you should do. And everyone up here, you have from the premier who's got the coolest job in the world, who I'm sure it wasn't easy for her but she believed in it and she's consistently done it. We talk about education. Now there's coding in schools yeah. at a younger it's age. It's just right? starting, yeah, it's just, we're just starting. Working with, the, with teachers, make sure teachers get the training that they want and they need to be able to, to teach it. And, and I mean, my, I, my vision would be that everybody who graduates from a high school in British Columbia speaks coding, is a coder whether it's a girl or a boy, so we're equal access to the tech industry if we want to go into it. And to me, that's the universal language. It's not Mandarin or English or French. Mm -hmm. um, it's coding. Well, you guys know that. I had someone ask me a question recently. They said if there was this person who knew anything, any answer that you could ever ask them, that they had the answer, but the only challenge is they speak a different language from you, would you learn the language to be able to ask this person anything you could ever want to learn? And that's essentially what it is with coding, right? It's learning the language to be able to ask computers to answer anything you could ever imagine. And those are the answers where questions haven't even been asked yet, huh. right? Yeah. It's a beautiful thing, finding the answers to questions that haven't even been asked yet. And that's what you guys are doing today, right? Like asking yourselves those questions. We talked about this earlier today. Ask yourself, like, why am I here? What am I passionate about? How did that start for you? Um, that's a really good question. It started out by not knowing what I wanted to do at all. I knew when I was in high school that I was good at math and physics and I loved it. I had the best math, physics, and calculus teacher and I wanted to be just like him. And I was like, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to teach just like he did. And then uh, as I started exploring career opportunities, someone, my mom, told me to try engineering. And I didn't know what engineering was, and I just took a chance and went into it and fell in love with coding, actually. It was my first year programming class, and I learned that I could think like a computer, and I could write script in a computer to tell it to do my bidding, and it was great. That's what I wanted to do. Um, and then I found I could do that with robots, and then I started building robots that played soccer by themselves and competing them around the world. And then I found this idea that, you know, doctors save lives, but engineers can save lives too. You can create the technology that doctors use to save lives and keep buildings up and strong so people can live and thrive, and you can really change people's lives through technology. And that was kind of my journey of how I got to where I am now, how I found my passion. It was like, this is a really cool thing and I'm really excited about it, but also it has the impact to, or the ability to impact hundreds of millions of people around the world, billions of people out of the whole world. It's great. That's amazing. And you never thought that you couldn't do it. 
And I, uh, so I, I was scared when you said, you know, you don't have to be scared. I was scared. I'm like, I, I don't know if I'm the right person to do this, but I just kept going. And I was like, if I'm not going to do it, then who will? And why can't I do it? And so I just, I just kept trying and putting things together. And Karina, I'm going to ask, can I ask them both a question? Absolutely. Because I'm going to bet that both of them have throughout their lives been surrounded by some people who have said, no, you can't do that. You're not going to be the guy that does that. It won't, you won't be able to do that. People that are deciding for you that you're not good enough to do this thing that you think you can do, and then, but you decided, both of you, to plow ahead somehow. My, my cousin's in from out of town. He's staying with us right now. And his, his saying is, why not us? Why not us? The world's not created by people who are smarter than us. It's just people who decide to do it. And back to your point of changing the world, it's all about getting started, right? You don't have to start with going, I'm gonna cure cancer, but I'm gonna help people live a little bit healthier lives and figure out through that journey that there might be an opportunity there that you never would have thought possible if you're just you know, sitting positively um, imagining what you could have done on your couch, right? So it's all about getting started. You can't change nothing, right? And you have to find out what really excites you, what you're really passionate about. And if it's this, this is a problem that you're thinking about all the time, then why wouldn't you be that person to carry that forward? Who else is going to get as excited about that problem if you're not the one to convince them that it's important for you? But my experience has been, from my own experience, and my son, who's 15, he came to me a couple of years ago, and he was really worried. And he said, you know, the thing is, is that everybody tells me at school and you know that I have to that I should follow my passion and I'm not really passionate about anything I don't know what my passion is mom when am I going to find out what my passion is tell him to go backpacking <laughs> yeah. Yeah. well you know he's figured it out since then nice. but I didn't figure out what my passion was until I was in my 20s yeah it doesn't you know you may not you may know it today you may not know it today but keep yourself open to figuring out what it is and then at some point be ready to change your paths when you figure out that thing that's going to mean that you get to go to work every day and just love what you do. And know that it can change, too. Know your that passion it can change, can change. Yep. You know, if you're on a path and it's going really well, and then you decide something else is really cool, too, and you want to try that, then be open to that, yes. that pivot. My son is not a hiker. Yeah. <laughs> we can change that. Yeah, I, bet you, yeah. I bet you can. Yeah. It's interesting that you guys say that, because for our, our team, uh, we talked about this earlier, how we came dead last in 2011, and our coach came up with, well, listen, he didn't come up with it, but he said, if not you, then who? If not now, then when? Yep. And it was one of those things, exactly what we're talking about is passion and purpose. You've got to do something in life that makes you not want to hit the snooze button when your alarm goes off. And that's when you'll know you're connected to it because you won't want to waste the day away doing nothing. It just ignites you. There's a fire in within you that says, yes, this is what I want to do. And if it's the tech world, and that's what I see from you guys today, because we've gone through it, that's what it is. But don't, as, as you're hearing over and over again, don't let somebody tell you no because their dreams failed. You say yes because it is your dream and your purpose. And Premier, you're a combination of passion and purpose. You have a passion, as we all see. You have a purpose. So talk to us a bit more about that combination for you as a woman in the role that you play. Um, you know, I, well, I, my dad was a school teacher, and my mom was involved in setting up daycares for people who couldn't afford it. And um, so I kind of grew up in a household where they were engaged in trying to change people's lives on a very individual level, and that was what they... We, learned, we really learned it from watching them, which was you should try and find your way into a profession where you are going to make live, other people's lives better. Hmm. And so I've always kind of followed that. Um, and, you know, public life is, a, is an expression of that. But so is, you know, creating um, an app and a monitoring system to help people monitor their mental health and their neurological function, changing healthcare, getting people out into the outdoors and figuring out how to connect them face to face in a world where we are really disconnected. I mean, those things through technology, um, we really are changing people's lives. Now there's a dark side to technology, which I think lots of people will know about and talk about. Well, we need help with that too. How do we invent technology that's gonna help us do better things? like these two are, and how do we create technology that's going to help us manage the downsides of some of the, you know, some of the consequences of the technology that's already out there? 
Yeah, I think when, when Steve Jobs said our, our main role as entrepreneurs is put a dent in the universe, I don't think he was necessarily referring to the next Angry Birds, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> like what, what can you do to put a dent in the universe to move society forward, right? And I think there's no one that has a greater thirst for that than the next generation that's coming up now. Mm -hmm. It's true. So where would you guys like to see technology in the next 10 years in the different fields that you are each in? I think technology is really going to transform healthcare. I mean, it already is, but it's going to transform our, our healthcare system, which is really dealing with people once they get sick. It's a sick care system, and turning that into more of a preventative medicine model and, and helping people be healthy uh, all the time. And so turning things like share shed and getting people outdoors and exploring will be integrated into the healthcare model. They'll no longer be like, oh, this is an adventure company and this is a health company. Like they will be integrated together in all aspects of daily life. And technology is so important to be integrated into that field. And so they'll, they're, right now there are companies, there are big data companies or, you know, companies that are only there to analyze all the information that we're creating online. But something like that is going to be uh, infused into every single industry, and the industries are going to start to blend together, I think. Yeah, and I guess focusing on ShareShittingGuides.com, on outdoor adventure, I can see in 10 years a world of unlimited access to adventure, where you have a sense of belonging anywhere you go, you're able to connect with people that are like-minded, that are, share the same values and passions as you, and there's nothing holding you back from getting outdoors and living vibrantly. Mm -hmm. Because, and, and I think that's a really important mm -hmm. element of this, because technology, social media in particular, means that we are interacting with other people without ever seeing them. And there's a real downside to the way that that has changed our society uh, and our human interaction. Yeah. There's a big upside to it too. I mean, I'm a big fan of social media, but I think anonymity, um, the anonymity of that connection really changes a human connection. Mm -hmm. And this is a way to use technology to get people to connect mm -hmm. face to face and to interact with the natural world. Um, you know, that's a, that's a big change mm -hmm. from the way we interact on social media. And that's a great, I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's why I think it's such a, um, a breakthrough innovation. Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> well done. High five. So yeah. we have some questions. We've actually gone and we asked you guys. You guys got to pick questions. So there was three questions, and I think all three of the students are here today. Um, it'll come up on the board. Um, but the first question, I believe, Nalissa Rung? Is Nalissa Rung here? Ah, there you are. Round of applause. Round of applause. So Nalissa had a question. So what we'll do is we'll cue in. It's, the question should come up on the video. Like, ah, the voice of God. Hello, my name is Melissa Runch, and I'm from Coralou Secondary School in Quinnell. With all our exciting innovations we have to date, I have a question to the developers of the future. How will you make sure we will be able to harness the exciting power of technology while maintaining face-to-face -face relationships? Ooh, Ooh, who wants to take this one? <laughs> That's a good question. Yay, Quinnell. That's a great question. So I think that ties in perfectly to what we were just talking about. And that's using the power of technology to get people offline and meeting face to face. So we're growing closer and closer globally right now, but we're moving further and further apart locally. And airsheddingguides.com, my passion is changing that, right? And there's actually an entire movement called the O to O strategy, so online to offline. How can we harness technology to actually get people to meet face to face? And we're seeing that with companies like Meetup, right? Where you can just create a Meetup post knitting group or whatever you want, and now you can actually meet up with people like-minded um, over, over mutual passions. Things like Airbnb, where you can travel the entire world and have a sense of belonging anywhere you go. It gives me goosebumps. I just got goosebumps thinking about Airbnb and the power of what they're doing and welcoming people into their own homes. So there are so many opportunities, regardless of what your passion is, to use technology as a tool to, for matchmaking, essentially. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Do you, do you want to answer that a bit? I Does it, can I ask a question? Who in the room feels like social media, although it brings us together, also pulls us apart in lots of ways? 
Yeah, because I, I mean, I, 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 I feel like that too. In some ways, I mean, it's almost like if you're at a social event and you're posting about it on social media, sometimes that's like, could be an anti-social thing to do. Exactly. Right? <laughs> exactly. But I feel like technology and social media gets a little bit of a bad rap on this yeah. front. Because I heard a story recently that when newspapers first came out, they said that it would change the way people have conversations. Yeah. Because instead of talking to one another at the breakfast table, for example, you're now reading a newspaper. And that is changing yeah. how people are actually interacting. And they said that that was going to be the worst thing in the world. Now we have social media. Mm -hmm. Newspapers became a standard. Now we have social media, and people read their social media, and so we're not interacting in the same way, but I think we're evolving, and I mm -hmm. think that there is a way to uh, use social media in a positive way to interact and get your message out and, and reach people that you've never reached before, um, and you're not physically in the same location as, and then you can also get outside and you Look know, at Pokemon Go. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I think, <laughs> I think with social, but, yeah. <laughs> Pokemon Go. Um, <laughs> no, I think with social media, one of the challenges is to make sure that we're true to who we are, yeah. right? And the premier brought that up is don't let anyone else create who you are. You intentfully, intentionally choose on the type of life that you want to live and making sure that you use your values as a filter in living authentic to who you are. And I think with social media, it gets into the challenge of if we're trying to portray something and some type of lifestyle that isn't actually reflective to our own values. So it's an amazing tool. I'm, I stay in touch with people I met while traveling. Yeah. I'm in touch with my family. So it really does bring us together, but it brings us together in an authentic way if we choose to make it like that. I think the fine line, though, is, is if you're having dinner or with your friends, to actually put the phone and turning upside down. Because I think the difficulty sometimes is actually just being present. Because we're so busy being like, oh, okay, I just got a, a text or a tweet or an Instagram, and you want to respond. But again, it's like the power of actually being present, because life passes you by if you're so busy about trying to be connected. Yeah. You know, I know for me, my, my, my parents are a little old school. So I, my mom still does FaceTime like this. Hi. <laughs> and I'm like, mom, I can just see your ear, put it down. <laughs> but I think it's important because they force us when it's family time to turn the phones over mm -hmm. and just be present. Because again, I think sometimes when, especially the youth interacting, they've forgotten the, the ability to have that conversation about, yeah, I heard this and this but stay in that conversation. And I think that's the challenge. I, I think that's why so many people are turning towards mindfulness. Yeah. Right? Is that we have so many triggers that are demanding our attention, right? Every time we get a buzz, it's a shot of dopamine, yeah. right? So we're hardwired to somewhat be addicted to technology. But the, uh, the ability for us to just like turn everything off for a minute, meditate, morning routines, right? Being able to control where we're not so reactive, but we're proactive in looking after ourselves, so. Yeah, fantastic. Good question. Question number two. Hello, Miss Clark. This is Stephanie. I'm from City Vancouver Academy. I'm in grade 12 now, and I'm going to ask you a question. What kind of technology do you expect to have in the future which facilitates people in positive way? Mm, good question. I, um, I think uh, in BC, we are going to be leaders in um, artificial intelligence. I think that's going to change the world. I can't even predict how that's going to change the world, but I'm told it will. <laughs> virtual, virtual and augmented reality. We're huge opportunities right here in BC. Again, uh, virtual reality, for example, will change. Anybody here from Poco? Is there anybody from Poco? Is there a couple people from Poco? So one of the biggest virtual reality studios in the world, Microsoft, is contracted with a company called Finger Foods out in Poco. And they're going to change the way we understand how to build public spaces, whole neighborhoods. It's going to change the way we, we operate healthcare. It's going to change, obviously, entertainment. It's going to change, it's, they are changing the way we build automobiles and trucks. Um, and, you know, I can't, I can't even guess what that's going to mean. I do think, though, right here, right now, we have um, some of the best cancer researchers anywhere in the world at the BC Cancer Center. If you are unlucky enough to be diagnosed with cancer, this is the best place in the world to be diagnosed because you're going to have the best chance of getting treated and cured. And we have a chance here, I, you know, honestly, to find the cure for cancer right here in the city of Vancouver. I think that wouldn't that be amazing if that was a British Come Columbia? Come on, guys. A British Columbia innovation. Now, 
just to jump in, so on a personal level, just to, I don't know if anyone watches Brené Brown, uh, but the power yeah, of vulnerability, power vulnerability yeah. right? And um, so just being vulnerable, my mom passed away from pancreatic cancer two months ago. And I think part of actually discovering the cure for cancer is educating ourselves around cancer. And I mean, this is, this is an interesting shift <laughs> for the no, panel, but it. I think it's super powerful because um, right now we're, we are so pro, um, reactive, right? You're diagnosed, then what do I do? But imagine if this audience today starts researching what leads to cancer, because we've all been affected to it, and then what can we do to help change that? Because um, I think that's where true innovation will come, is from someone who's just extremely curious about exactly. something outside of the industry and starts educating, and then one innovation after the other, then will lead to, to a cure at least miles ahead of where we are today. Mm -hmm. And I think as BC is becoming more um, leaders and experts in artificial intelligence and machine learning um, and virtual and augmented reality, we can use those technologies to for cancer research, for example. Imagine if you can pick up a device and you can see the tumor um, you know, on your phone. You can see it in 3D. You can see how it interacts with other systems, all because um, this AI system is making that for you and your virtual reality or augmented reality machine is displaying it for you and then how that can empower researchers to then learn more. And machines and artificial intelligence can then take and look at those patterns that we don't necessarily recognize with our human brains and be able to analyze them and come up with new suggestions for research on, on how to move forward. So bringing all of those innovations and technology together for cancer research, just as an example, there's so many other applications. I'm starting to feel like it. I'm sitting beside the person who is actually going to cure cancer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice. That's amazing. I just like technology. So. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that story with us, Daniel. I think. Everything you're hearing here, guys, is, is exactly like the Premier said. Like, imagine if you took your passion and something you care about and you love and you can actually help save lives. That's powerful. And I think that's what you guys need to process right now is that it's a simple passion that you took, but it's, it's a mom that he lost that your passion could help save somebody's life you don't know but help change the lives of others. And I think that's pretty powerful. So thank and you for sure. As simple as I, one thing that I had no idea of how, how important it is, is taking vitamin D. Out of all things, taking vitamin D. And living in Vancouver, there's a chance that most of us here are vitamin that's D the deficient. Sun, right? Yeah, for, from the sun, right? You get vitamin D from the sun. And uh, when my mom was diagnosed, her vitamin D levels were near non-existent. They are extremely low. Um, so we had my dad just uh, the other week, two weeks ago, get tested for vitamin D. The doctor said he'll only call if it's serious, and the only reason he was following up with his blood work is because of extreme low levels of vitamin D. So um, that's one of the things that would be great, I know this is off topic, but a powerful takeaway to, to just do a little bit of homework on how important vitamin D is and then have that conversation with your parents. Wow. Sooner than later. I'm going to go get some vitamin D. <laughs> and the, the powerful thing is vitamin D comes from the sun, so you can create a daily habit, a reminder to shine bright and be true to who, you're, who you are, right? Just like what the Premier was saying, when you're choosing to live your own life. So, so Premier, can we get more sun here in BC? No. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> where, where are we at with that? Well, <laughs> climate change. I mean, if we're depending on climate change to make it better, that's a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. We should be fighting climate change. <laughs> yeah. All right, the third question comes from Ruben Stepler from Pacific Coast School in Prince Rupert. Is she here? Are you here? Are we here? Yeah. There you go. A little, little life back there. All right, let's check out the question. I come from an economically disadvantaged household, and I'm looking at a mortgage on my education. How will your government provide funding and incentives for students interested in science and technology at the post-secondary level? Mm. Fantastic question, Ruben. Um, and so a couple of things. One, um, we've just, you know, make, make student loans more accessible and cheaper, which is what we've just recently done, but also increase the number of spaces that are available. And, you know, that's one of the things that we're finding in, in science and technology, the STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, um, is that there are huge long lineups for people to get in. Lots of people want to get in, and you can't get in unless you have absolutely the top marks. I in wouldn't British get in Columbia if I applied today. for engineering. Yeah, today. <laughs> so the, exactly. And you know, you've done pretty well, right? Turned out you were a good investment. So we should. <laughs> we've got. So we've got. We are expanding the number of seats in post-secondary institutions in the STEM 
areas to try and make it a little bit easier for people to get in from all across the province um, and make it easier for anybody to be able to get in if you're a British Columbian. Um, and also, you know, one of the things we're, we're thinking about doing is creating STEM schools. So high schools around the province where you, they specialize, because you know there are schools that specialize in the fine arts, there are schools that specialize in athletics, let's maybe some schools that specialize in STEM, where you know it's, it's all publicly, 100% publicly funded, and it will prepare you to really get into a post-secondary institution anywhere in the world to study, uh, to study any, any areas of, of the like, uh, science, science, technology, engineering, and math. And that's, we've really got to open up that um, those avenues for people. The other reason is, it's not just so people can get in and get the education, it's so that technology companies will want to locate and start businesses here because one of the biggest things that's going to attract a tech business to Prince Rupert is knowing that there are a lot of people in Prince Rupert who can do coding, who are educated as engineers, who are going to be able to go to work for them in that business. And we've got to spread that all around the province. We've got to make sure people are available and then those companies will come and that'll mean more tech jobs and more jobs for people to go work in. Great answer. Great answer. I think, well, and bringing it back to technology as a whole, it empowers people to get educated for a lot less, right? There's massive online open courses called MOOCs where you can take Stanford level, uh, level education for free. The only challenge is people being disciplined when they're not actually paying any money to attend these incredible courses that are online. And you can do it now. If you haven't heard of them, you don't have to wait until you're in university to participate in these yep. courses. Anyone can sign up. If you're eight years old, you can sign up for a course on data analytics or an intro to programming if you don't have that in your classroom, and you can learn that right now. Mm -hmm. And one of the other investments that we're, we're making um, this year is in, is in the First Nations Technology Council. And the reason I raise this, I don't know if Ruben is a First Nations um, uh, community, but <laughs> lots of kids in Rupert at Pacific Coast School will be. And one of the things we know is that the First Nations communities are the fastest growing demographic in British Columbia. And that's a, a huge opportunity for employers and a huge opportunity for British Columbia to get people engaged in the workforce. But many First Nations kids find it difficult to step into the technology sector because many are from smaller rural or remote communities. Mm -hmm. So making an investment in the First Nations Technology Council, which will specifically target education in technology for First Nations students to encourage a lot more First Nations people to find their way into the technology industry. Because there are, for First Nations people as well, there are specific health challenges that need to be solved and need to be approached, specific cultural issues mm -hmm. that need to be supported and need to be approached. And it will be First Nations people that are going to be coming up with the answers to that, but they need to be in the industry if we want to make sure that they're there to do it. So many things to process here. I think, <laughs> like, if I were to ask you a question, let me start with the premier because we have to close it up, but if I were to ask you, go back to being their age, what would you tell yourself at that age as an advice to follow? You know, when I look back to being, um, like, who, what, is everybody kind of like between 15 and 18 here? Mm -hmm. yeah. Most people? Yeah. Most people, put your hand up if you're between 15 and 18. Me, yeah. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so I look back when I was 15 and 18, and I was um, not a very pretty girl, and I was um, at a high school in Burnaby, in a junior high in Burnaby back in the day, and I was really insecure, and um, I really didn't have very much ambition for myself, and nobody really had any ambition for me because it wasn't obvious at all that I could ever be successful at anything at the time. And I remember the overwhelming feeling was being scared of being judged by other people. And what I used to do when I was 15 is I used to accept people's judgment of who I was rather than creating my own sense of who I was. And it was, in, you know, I look back at it, Karina, and I feel like when I was 15, the biggest feeling I had most of the time was I was scared. Mm. I was scared of being judged. I was scared of failing. I was scared of trying. I was scared of growing up. I was just scared a lot. And when I look back, you know, if I could go back to being 15, I was way better at 15 than I am now, except that I'm just a lot more confident now. I had a lot more going for me. And so my advice for all of you would be 
Don't be scared. Don't accept other people's judgment about who you are. Don't let peop other people decide who you are and what you can be. Don't let them kill your dreams. Figure it out and find that confidence in yourself. Because if you can find that confidence when you're 15 rather than you're 25 or 35 or 45, you are going to be a huge success at whatever you decide to do. <laughs> Andrea, you want to you wanna take that question? You have a different path. What would you tell your 15, 18-year-old self? Um, I feel like when I was 15 and I was trying to decide about my university path, I focused a lot on you know, finding the right path and finding something that would be certain, that I knew I was going to love and I would want to do for the rest of my life. But we were talking about this earlier, and I think you really have to be OK taking risks. And you have to be OK knowing that this path, this thing you really, really want to try, it might not be the best thing for you, but you're not going to know until you actually do it. There's a quote by someone named Tom Chi. Do you know the Google Glasses? Do you know what Google Glasses are? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Tom Chi was the one who made the first version of the Google Glasses. And his quote that he says all the time is, thinking is a terrible way to think. Doing is the best way of thinking. Mm. And you really have to <laughs> go out and you have to do it. And you have to take those risks because you're never going to know for sure just by thinking about it. Oh, that's a great answer. You don't have to be perfect. Exactly. Not every decision has to be perfect. Yeah. Time to start doing. Yeah. How about you? Yeah, I'm thinking back. When I was that age, I was a, I was a terrible student. Um, I started skipping class. And Don't just, tell and people I, that. And I really do not regret that, no. <laughs> um, Were you also this tall? <laughs> oh, I was skyrocketing. Oh, yeah, I was like that awkward phase, right? <laughs> um, but, uh, but it was just, I wasn't passionate about what was being taught in school. And then when I went into university, I found my passion, right? I found, and, and education is less about filling a bucket with information by reading and more about igniting your spark and finding what your spark is and then following that, right? And I think one of the best decisions I made was when I graduated high school, I took a year off and I backpacked Australia mm. for six months, Australia and Fiji, and it just changed my life. It just revealed so much about the type of lifestyle that I want to create for myself. Um, as far as advice, there's one thing I just thought of. I actually saw my, um, my buddy Mike in the audience today, and I spoke on a panel with him recently and he came down to the end of the panel and what advice we would give. And he shared the best story, and hopefully I don't butcher it for him. But uh, he was on a walk with his grandma, and uh, they were walking behind the family a bit, and she brought him back and was like, Mike, I, I, want, you to, I want you to promise me something. He, she said, I want you to promise me that you'll view your life as a movie, and that you pick the characters that are in that movie, you pick the adventures that you go on, you pick the entire plot that you want to create. And promise me one thing, that when your grandchildren watch that movie, that by the end of it, they'll want to see it again. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just it. so, so, so powerful, and it's wow. resonated with me so much. Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Good advice, Mike. Well, as you've heard here today, you've heard incredible speakers, but it's about knowing that being scared is OK. It's about doing and not thinking. And it's about creating your own movie that generations to come, your grandkids, will be proud of. I mean, for me, I've told you guys this before, like, don't be scared of failure. Dare to fail greatly. It's a beautiful thing because beyond that, as you hear over and over and over again, is your truth, your greatness. We all have a greatness within us, whether you felt left out and you didn't fit in and you were scared at that age, I'm still scared now too. Whether you decided to just make the decision, you know what, the time is now and the time is to do it. Whether it's to do a 100 kilometer race in a foreign country and to know that, you know what, so much more of it is mental that you know that's life. But I think you walk away from here understanding that no matter what avenue you take, Time is now to do. Time is now to dream. Time is now is to believe. And time is now for you to understand that in this room are the future heroes. In this room are the future doers. In this room are the game changers. And as the premier said, BC is where it's at. So I want to thank you guys all for being Thanks, here. Karina. This has been fun. Have Thanks, you guys everybody. had a blast with them? Mm. Round of applause. Thanks, Karina.
And I don't know if the Premier, if you want to say anything else, because, or if you guys wanted to step off. Well, I hope everybody enjoys the rest of the conference. I, you know, I just hope that everybody here walks away with a connection, an idea, an inspiration that means that every one of you can pursue your dream in technology. This is the place to be for tech. I think in the next 10, 15 years, we are going to be one of the world's great tech hubs, but we're only going to be that if we have great people building it. And the great people that are going to be building it are all of you, so get to work. We, we have high expectations. Thank you for coming, all of you. All right, a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thanks. You're a rock star. That was awesome. That was awesome. Is my mic's out? Thank you, Dennis. Live events. There's my mic. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Look after yourself. Thank you. Love the outfit, all of you. Thank you.